So as Sunshine said, I'm going to be talking about energy in the developing world. And this is just to emphasize the point that climate change is a unique environmental problem. We're used to dealing with local environmental issues, things like particulate matter, clean water issues. But climate change is truly a global issue. And so one of the things that we need to keep in mind in confronting climate change is other regions of the globe, outside of California, outside of, of the US. And in particular, we really need to think about energy use in the developing world. So I want to make that, that simple point uh, with a couple of slides. I'm an empirical economist, and I like to think about different ways of displaying data. And this is one of my favorite ways to think about where in the world electricity is being used, and, and in general, where in the world energy is being used. So you can look at this, first of all, from the California perspective and say, you know, it's kind of neat. You can actually see the population centers. You can see where people are living. So you can see the Bay Area and LA. If you look closely, you can see Sacramento. Up the coast, you can see Portland, Vancouver. You know, you can see the eastern seaboard pretty well lit up. If you look at Europe, you can see London, Paris, Madrid, the big, uh, you know, the big population centers. And uh, oh yeah, there's the rest of the world. So here is where people actually live in the world. This is people per square meter. So you can see that in, for instance, northern India, there's a lot of people. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, the population density is about the same as the eastern US. So if you so, uh, superimpose the lights on the people, you see that the lights aren't really where the people live. That there are a lot of people in Sub-Saharan Africa, in China, uh, in India, who aren't using electricity now and who aren't using modern forms of energy. So this map, this picture of where the lights are, that's going to change over the next 30, 40, 50 years. And it's a really good thing from a development perspective that that's going to change. People's lives are enhanced when they get access to electricity, access to other forms of, of modern energy. But from a climate perspective, we need to be thinking about what impacts policies that we're talking about, technologies that we're talking about, will have on the developing world. So here's the kind of boring graphical way of making the same point, but, but just to put some numbers on this, what I'm plotting here are quadrillion BTU. So I'm adding together all different forms of, of energy, converting them into to BTU, adding together electricity, natural gas, gasoline for transportation, and then plotting the non-OECD, so the developing world, and the OECD. So first of all, you can see that the developing world has already surpassed the, the developed world in terms of energy consumption. And basically, all of the forecast growth over the next 30, 40 years is going to come in the developing world. The developed world is supposed to go up by about 14 percent. The developing world is projected to go up by, by about 85 percent, so almost double. These are projections made by the Energy Information Administration at the Department of Energy. But if you look at projections by other, other organizations, the International Energy Agency, BP, does a lot of energy forecasting. They're, they're very similar. So that, first of all, makes the point that, that I wanted to start with, that we really need to think about what climate mitigation solutions will do for energy use in the developing world, how, how they'll translate into the developing world. I also suspect, and some of my research focuses on this, I, I suspect that even that pretty dramatic growth in the developing world is an underestimate, that there may be even larger growth in the developing world. So let me show you one reason I think that might be the case. Um, this is a graph, again, plotting total quads of energy use, so adding together all different types of energy. But now what the axes presents are not, not those actual quads, but I've normalized it to uh, 1990 use. So you see that in 1990, it's at a 1. This is plotting uh, China's electricity, or sorry, energy consumption. And so the first thing you see, the black line represents actual consumption. The first thing you see is really dramatic growth in energy consumption. So by 2010, the line is above 3. And remember, that's relative to 1990 use. So that suggests that between 1990 and 2010, China's energy use more than tripled. It just grew dramatically. What the colored lines show you is what the EIA, and again, I'm using EIA data, but they're very similar projections from other organizations, 
That's what the EIA projected China's energy use would be. So the, the bottom lines there are from the early 2000s. They were projecting that by 2010, China's energy use would double relative to 1990. But if you look at the black line, China passed that level of energy consumption in like 2003, so six and a half years early. And so the EIA had to say, well, whoops, we underestimated that one, and up their forecast. And so that's what you see with the colored lines, that they're kind of continually updating their forecast to try to catch up with China's actual growth. And basically the point is that everywhere, this is, this is not just happening in 2005 and 2010, that, that kind of continually the colored lines are below the black lines, that continually the forecasts are below the actual. So you might think, okay, that's a China story. China's had rapid growth in, in their GDP. Maybe that's part of what's going on. But there's similar patterns that emerge uh, in India. So again, the black line is plotting the actual. The colored lines are the projections. And the black line is, is above the, the, the colored lines. And you see that the projections are kind of being updated. They're, they're increasing their projections once the projections are passed a couple years early. And similarly, um, oops, I thought I had sub-Saharan Africa. So if you, if you do a similar graph for sub-Saharan Africa, you see a similar story. And so I think that, that I've talked to the EIA about this, and they're updating their forecasting methodology. But I think if you think back to the first graph I showed you with the 85 percent projection in energy consumption, that that could well, uh, similar to these graphs, that could well be an underestimate. Okay, so what do we need to do? Uh, we need to think about what's going on in the developing world. We really need to understand what's driving energy consumption. I have some research that suggests that as people come out of poverty and enter the middle class, they have a very nonlinear, dramatic increase in energy consumption. Basically, you get connected to the grid, you buy a refrigerator, you start getting refrigerated foods um, delivered to you through the cold chain. So, people's energy consumption, per capita energy consumption, goes up dramatically. And to me, the EIA graphs, the, the fact that they have to kind of continually update suggests that we don't really understand what's happening in the developing world. Um, so this is, you know, a, a, a researcher saying we need more research. That, that's that's self-indulgent, I, I aware, but, um, or I, I understand, but I, I, I think it's the case. Um, also, we need to develop both technological and policy solutions that reduce the environmental harm. So it's, it's not just about kind of new fancy technologies, new uh, whiz-bang things, but it's also about policies, about things that will drive new technologies, things that will drive lower uh, carbon energy consumption. But importantly, we need to gauge whatever the technological or policy solutions we come up with, with how well they'll translate, how well they'll impact energy consumption in the developing world, in China and in India and in Sub-Saharan Africa. So if I could ask something of, of you as journalists, whenever you're covering an issue, if you're covering kind of or California climate policy, ask, at least in the back of your head, how will this translate to the developing world? I mean, for instance, a, a 60,000 electric car, it's a really beautiful car. The Tesla is, is, is beautiful. But in Tanzania, less than 1 in 20 people own uh, a vehicle. And less than 1 in 5 people in Tanzania are connected to the electric grid. So an electric, a $60,000 electric, $60, electric car is not going to dramatically transform uh, Tanzania's energy consumption. And I'm just using Tanzania as, as an example. It, it's true of the rest of the developing world. Or the way in which the Tesla will impact energy consumption in the developing world is, is kind of, there, there are a lot of steps that are involved there. You need to think about, you know, driving down the price of electrifying transportation um, and, and kind of making it accessible to, to the rest of uh, the world. So as I say, I encourage you to think, okay, how will these climate policies it's great if we're reducing GHGs in California and the U.S., but how is that going to impact the rest of the world and, importantly, the developing world? Okay, so one example of this, this is a, a, an issue that I've come across in my research and, and um, you know, something that I've been in the popular press come out kind of against uh, 
off-grid solar. So let me let me just. I get, it's, it's not fair to say that I'm against off-grid solar, but I think that it's getting way too much attention uh, relative to the impacts that it can have. So one, and, and there's three reasons that I'll say that. One of the reasons, uh, and this is a, a chart from some research that I'm doing in Western Kenya, is that I think the way we currently hear about electricity in Sub-Saharan Africa and in India is that there are people who are on grid and then there are people who are off grid. If you're on grid, you have a connection, you know, maybe it's not very reliable, you often hear about that. And if you're off grid, the mental image that that conjures up is that you're kilometers away from the um, nearest grid connection, that, that you're living far away and that it would be very expensive to extend the grid to you just based on that geographic distance. What we've seen in Western Kenya and a lot of, uh, and other people have extended this to other parts of the developing world is that there are many households who we describe as being under grid. So if you look at this picture, what it's showing in the middle there, the T is a transformer. So there's a distribution system that, that's coming into the transformer. The yellow dots are households who have grid connections, and the green dots are households who don't have grid connections. What this picture shows is representative of what we sh uh, found throughout the area across 150 transformers that about 5% of the households are connected to the grid. And the white line is drawn with a 600 meter radius. So there are people who are living literally under the grid where the distribution lines are passing over their houses but they're not connected to the grid. So to me that suggests that there are really not necessarily technological issues that we need to solve. The technology is there, the grid is there, but we need to think about the pricing regimes, the, the expense of connecting people to the grid. So in Kenya, it costs $400 to connect to the grid, and this is an area where the average annual income uh, for households is about $800. So it's just an extremely high um, price to connect to the grid. So I, I guess that's one reason why I think you know, off-grid solar, it, it's not necessarily the best solution for people who are right next to the technology. It might be a good solution for people who are living in remote, low population density areas, but if they're, if they're low population density, they're not that many people that are living there. Okay, the second reason that I think off-grid solar is not necessarily the silver bullet is that we've surveyed households and asked them what they would do, some of the green dots in that, in that previous picture, we've asked them, what would you do if you were given an electricity connection? Um, this is part of a study where we subsidized, in some cases, up to 100% households to connect to the electricity grid, and then we're tracking how they um, use the electricity and how that transformed their lives. And so before we did that, we, we kind of asked them, well, how do you anticipate using the electricity? And we found something that, that frankly surprised me. Um, so the number one appliance that they wanted to, or, or the number one usage uh, that they would put electricity to was for lighting. They wanted to replace their kerosene with, with electric lighting. They wanted to charge cell phones and they wanted TVs. That's not that surprising. The number four item on the list was irons. So that's, that is something that surprised me. And, you know, at first I thought, well, it's nice to have freshly ironed clothes, they, they look neater, but it also turns out that there are um, parasites that live in the cloth, and so if you iron it, you're, you're killing uh, the parasites. So there are public health reasons for wanting an iron, or for wanting an electric iron. The reason that irons favor the grid is because irons right now use about 1,500 watts. They're very high power appliances. So that's 1,500. The most common off-grid solar home system in Kenya right now is 8 watts. So it's 1,500 versus 8. You would need just like, you know, literally hundreds of off-grid um, apparatuses in order to power an iron. And an iron is really perfectly suited for the grid where you're averaging across a bunch of people. You use your iron for you know, 10, 15 minutes at a time. And if there are a bunch of people and they're using their irons for, for different amounts of time, you're, you're or at different points in time, you're kind of averaging across um, users in a way that, that the grid allows you to do, but where standalone solar home systems don't. 
Okay, the, the, I think the most important reason why um, off-grid solar is not the silver bullet, and, and by this I, I, I don't mean to dismiss um, the idea that um, off-grid can transform some people's lives. If you're far away from the grid, if you replace kerosene with an off-grid solar system, that, that's less pollution, that, that can be good for some people. But in some ways I think it's, it's almost irrelevant from a climate change perspective. The, the, uh, households that are buying off-grid solar kits, they're, they're um, poor, they're not using very much electricity, where the real growth in energy consumption is going to come from is people who are already connected to the grid, households who are already connected to the grid, and more importantly, the commercial and industrial sectors. And you just can't run a health center, a mall with a cold, uh, cold stone creamery on a, a solar home system. This is a picture from a mall in Nigeria, and I think it's important to recognize that that, that is economic development. That's what people aspire to. They aspire to go to an air-conditioned mall and, and buy ice cream, and you can't power that on a solar, um, solar home system. Okay, so one final thought before I close. And I know I, I'm motivated to study energy in the developing world, thinking about climate change. I think if you're interested in issues like world oil prices, for similar reasons, you want to understand energy demand in the developing world. That's where all the growth in, in energy demand is going to be. But I also think it's important to, to acknowledge that energy is, is a real strong driver of economic growth. And so we can kind of wring our hands about, oh, there's going to be lots of energy use in the developing world. From a development perspective, that's fantastic. That, that's, that's a wonderful thing. So what this shows is country by country, there's a very strong correlation, positive correlation, between uh, GDP per capita, that's what's on the horizontal axis, and energy, this is electricity use per capita. Uh, that point was made to me very personally once as, as part of our study uh, two years ago. As I said, we were subsidizing people to connect to the electricity grid. And I was, this is a, a woman in western Kenya, I was there on the day when the people climbed up the poles, dropped down the wire, like screwed in the light bulb and it went on. It was, it was really um, impressive and, and really, um, yeah, really touching. She was so thrilled to get electricity in her house. She, she saw this as a real gain to her, her personal development that uh, she gave me a chicken. So, you know, never did I expect as part of my research to be the <laughs> recipient of a, of a gift chicken. Um, but, yeah, it, it, and our field officer there said, you got to keep it. I mean, I felt heartbroken a little bit to take a valuable asset from this person, but she said, you got to, she wants to give you a present, so you got you to accept it. Um, okay, just to close, I want to mention that at UC Berkeley, we've, in the past couple of months, started a program that's funded by DFID in the UK to do research on energy and economic growth, to, to try to fill some of the research gaps that I think exist in understanding what's going on with, with energy in the developing world. <laughs>